Okay, good morning everyone. <clears throat> so I will um, resume where we left off last time. I just realized though, go, going over the notes, that I had skipped over this particular slide earlier on. Uh, don't worry about finding it. It's slide 34 if you're looking to reference it later. You will see periodically in this sec section of the course, I will um, have some topics up here from Dr. Marlin, who originally created these slides. And uh, these point out some extensions to the material that you can go on and learn a bit more about what this, this topic is, but in an area that's a little bit different and outside the scope of the course, and usually applicable to you. So the first one up there asks you to go look at the terms of simple interest and compound interest, nominal interest and effective interest. Those are four types of interest terms that are used and you will certainly see that at, le at the very least on your credit card statement. So when you read the fine print there, they will actually distinguish between how they charge you interest. And you can be sure that the credit card company is charging you the type of interest that is going to bring them the most money. So read up on that and the, the distinctions on that for, for yourselves. The other question to think about part two is to consider when interest rates or time value of money are not fixed. We've actually considered that earlier. I showed you that chart of interest rates over historical period of time in the past 60 years to give you a sense of how that varies. Um, this third question looks at a credit card type problem. The fourth question here asks you to look at the term usury. Um, so one of the ways, the easiest ways to describe usury is abusive interest charges. If you at any point go, usually on a Friday, downtown in most Canadian cities, you will see all the payday loan places with their bright yellow signs offering free money. And essentially these companies are ex asking people to come in and exchange their paycheck in an advance, for an advance of cash, right? And they're charging right at the maximum amount of interest rate. So the government has a maximum interest rate that can be charged on loans. These companies are charging exactly at that rate. It is a fairly abusive practice. If you read up a bit about how those payday loan companies work, you'll actually see the ethical concept behind it isn't very sound. It, you would probably sit and read it and think and come to that conclusion. So usury is a term that the government uses and there's laws and regulations in place to prevent usury from occurring. Um, another interesting concept related to interest is the concept of Sharia compliant finance or finance without charging interest rates. There's a variety of ways that that can be structured. So there's an interesting articles online on, so there are multiple articles in fact on this and, and it's counterintuitive how can you have someone invest money or how can you have a mortgage with no interest being charged. Okay, so it's interesting how these companies and Sharia compliant banks and financial institutions have set up ways to accommodate for that. So that's worth reading up on. And then there's two spreadsheet functions that will help with the calculations we've been looking at in this course, PV, present value, and FV, future value. So there's multiple inputs in those spreadsheet functions and they can save you a bit of time and shortcuts, right? I don't want you to necessarily go use them for this course. I do prefer that you simply use that single equation we use that shows F is equal to P times I, 1 plus I raised to the power N, and apply that. But the PV and FE functions can do some of that and short circuit a bit of the manual calculation aspect for you. So use those if you're confident with the, with the existing ways of doing stuff and you're looking for shorter ways. Similarly, for those of you that have taken business courses, you've learned about a variety of formulas that can switch between present value and future value um, depending on what information you know and you don't know. And so you can certainly use those in this course, but I'm telling you now that from next class onwards, you will find it very difficult to apply those formulas that you've learned because we're going to look at taxes and depreciation. And that starts to make those formulas extremely complex and messy. So let's, I won't go into those details for the business students. Um, but I'll certainly stick to the simpler versions in this class. So that was back there on slide 34 that I skipped over. 
let's go back to where we were last time and we were considering the measure of profitability given by NPV. And we ended off the class at this table in slide 60. <clears throat> so what we were considering here was how companies get money. And I'd say to you, because unlike us, when we were looking for money, we would ask families and friends and a bank for money, companies have actually a variety of avenues to get money. They can get money from the bank, but they don't have to go to one bank. They can get some money funded for their new project, partially by one bank and partially from another bank. And each bank might give them different interest rates. So if you want to install a new $50 million expansion, one bank might cover 20 million, another bank 30 million, and those two sources of money come at different interest rates. One bank is not comfortable giving you everything, and so they'll, they'll fund it partially. Companies can also get a blend of their money from investors, so not just banks, but private investors who've come together and lend money to other institutions, so private investment, and then public investment on the stock market is, is another way of saying that. So you can go at any point in time today and buy stock in any Canadian company on the TSX, Toronto Stock Exchange, and you're essentially, you've become a partial owner of that company. That company is not guaranteeing that you'll get your money back. If you've given them $1,000, they've given you maybe four or five stock for that $1,000, and you're hoping that in a year or two or more years in the future, that that $1,000 stock value has gone up in value so that when you go to sell the stock, you recover your money. That increase in money that you get, that money comes and is funded by partially other investors as well as the company themselves. And the company stock price goes up because other people believe that the value in that company is higher, so the price is driven up. So there's a finite number of stock that it, the company issues so there's a finite supply and demand. The company doesn't just have an infinite number of stock. There's a finite supply of those stocks to buy. And so the price is determined on a stock exchange, which is where the supply and demand is met. Okay, so Apple stock most recently split because it was at a value of the four, five, six hundred dollar range. So to buy one stock might co cost too much, so all that Apple does is they split the stock. So if you owned one stock previously, you now own two stocks at half the value. So, okay, so my point with that discussion is to make you recognize that companies don't have one source of interest rate. They have multiple rates. That's a blend of all these sources of debt and equity. So I mentioned those two terms last class, debt and equity. And each of those, there's multiple sources of debt, multiple sources of equity at different rates come together and the company in their finance department can determine what we've called the MARR, Minimal Acceptable Rate of Return. Because this is the thinking. If the company can get, let's work with a million dollars from a variety of sources, the average interest rate, let's use again a number of say 15% for this example, the average cost of that money to the company is 15%. They can get that million dollars and they can now choose to invest it in a project, buy a new distillation column, expand their capacity in their plant. And they're hoping that by doing so, they can earn more than that 15%. Because they owe the banks 15%. They own their stock owners. They owe that money back at that 15% blended rate. So a company that's choosing to invest that million dollars in a project is hoping to get returns that exceed 15% so that they can not only pay back their investors, but they've got money left over and returned a greater investment back to themselves. Is that concept clear? Okay, people struggle with that idea of where companies get money from, but the, the moment you recognize that company do, companies don't have money sitting around for free, that million dollars doesn't come for free. There's a cost associated with it and we can calculate the percentage of that cost. And that percentage cost 
is determined by the finance department internal to your company. You can always go to someone in your company and get the MARR value. And companies may set different MARRs for different markets. So a small company will have one MARR, but a larger company operating in the oil sands in Canada will have an MARR. That same oil company operating in Sarnia will have a different MARR. And if they're operating in an uncertain market in a different continent, they may set an even higher MARR for that region because the risk is high in that region. So they're, if they're going to spend their money in, let's say, a, in a continent where the risk is higher, they're certainly looking for a greater return on that. Otherwise, they're going to pass by that investment. Is that concept clear? So if the company's MARR is fixed, it doesn't change. Once you know the MARR, that number is set. Okay. Now let's go back to a concept I, I had spoken about in, in the prior class, and we use this formula up on the board for NPV. So I'll just write out the first few terms again. NPV is some sort of cash flow in your first period, 1 plus i to the 0, plus the cash flow in the next period, 1 plus i to the 1. And the second cash flow, and so on. OK, so you've got these cash flows that you've projected in the future in C1, C2. These are projections of cash coming in in the future. NPV, we said last class, anyone want to give me a definition back of NPV? Okay, what you would possibly make in today's terms. So firstly, the important point is NPV is a dollar figure. It's not a percentage. It's not a period of time. It's a dollar figure. And it's a dollar figure in today's money. And if NPV is positive, you've made a profit in today's money. If NPV is negative, you've made a loss in today's money. So what we've done is we said, We've taken that future cash flow, let's use the cash flow in period two, and what that formula does is it gives you the value of cash flow two in today's terms. So that's PV of the cash flow two in today's terms. Okay. And you're going to see by the end of, by the, end of the class why we keep bringing things back to present value. And Last class, we had looked at that example. I'll just um, bring it back up here for you. It's, you'll recall this calculation where we had these cash flows, 91,000 flowing out as an expense, 20,000, 40,000, 40,000 flowing in. And when you did the calculation, um, let's go back to that. I apologize for being cut off here. Let's maybe just drop this down a bit. Okay. We said that the cumulative sum of that present values, in other words, the NPV was $20,000. That was a $20,000 NPV over the period of time. And the, we had used an, a rate here of I equals 15%. Okay. We also looked at last class, and you convinced yourselves that if that interest rate I were to decrease, so if I goes from 15% and now is 10%, what happens to NPV? It goes up, okay? So we're dividing through by smaller denominators that NPV goes up. And there's a spreadsheet on the course website with this, this example in it. You can go try it out there. So there's NPV currently at 15%. If you go put in point 0.1, that 0.26 over there in bold uh, becomes 36,000. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at this. Let's draw this out a bit. So I'm going to plot interest rate here in the horizontal direction. 
This is, going, this is the hard concept I had actually spoken about last class. People get thrown a little bit by this. So let's pay attention here. This is my interest rate I. And what I'm going to do is draw on this diagram the MARR. So I'm going to draw it in red. It's a fixed value. We cannot ever go change it. So there is my MARR. I just go speak to someone in the finance department. They tell me this number. So I, let's maybe call it I star, M-A-R-R. -R. And for this example, I'm going to put it at 15% as well. So I go ask them. They tell me it's 15%. Okay, so on this vertical axis now, we can go plot the NPV. And NPV, when we put time value of money equals to zero, we did this last time as well. When we said NPV is equal to zero, we're in fact ignoring time value of money. We're saying the value of $10,000 today is the same as $10,000 next year, the year after. There's no, de no deflation in monetary value. So then the cash flow is simply the cumulative sum of all your cash flows. And as shown here in the slides, you get $78,900. So up here, remember this vertical axis is dollars now. NPV is a dollar figure. I can go find $78,900. I'm just going to round it a little bit. So $78,900 at an interest rate of I equals zero. That is an, another way of saying that 78,900 is simply your cumulative cash flow, not ignoring time value of money. Everyone clear on where that one came from? I equals zero. Okay. Now, let's go look at what happens if I happens to be the MARR of the company. The MARR of the company was 0.15. We plug that in and Maybe I don't have an internet connection anymore. Yep, okay, it's gone. But it's not too critical because I have them listed over here. So 0 0.15, 20,600, okay? So I equals 15% is 20,600. So if I calculate the NPV at that interest rate I, I get 20,600. If I calculate NPV at 10%, so 10% is over here, my formula is 36,000. Okay. And if I do it at 5%, I get a number that's somewhere in between at 55,000. Okay, so what we're seeing then is essentially that sort of change. As your interest rate, or as that time value of money, so I also said last class, I'm going to start referring to this simply as TVM, time value of money, goes higher, your NPV drops. Essentially, as we're going to higher rates here, we're deflating our money faster and faster. So in this direction, We deflate money at a faster rate. So the value of the money becomes less. So that future $40,000, $30,000 cash flows are worth less and less. And so when we sum up the NPV, we get a smaller number and this drops down. Okay, at 20%, uh, I can just go look up here. If I had the internet, it would solve and work out for me. But at 20%, that value is 7,000. So we're over there at 7,000. And if I go to 30%, that number is negative 11,000. I get a negative. Okay, so somewhere over here, I cross zero. Negative NPV. So let's 
let's focus on that point over there. A negative NPV, is that desirable? No, okay, it says we've made a loss in today's terms. So if time value of money was 30%, if we found ourselves in an in a area of the world or a point in time when TVM, time value of money, is 30%, we would have made a loss on this investment. Yes, Mark? It's mostly linear. There's a little bit of an exponential curve to it. Okay. In fact, let's go to your notes. You have the plot of that over there on slide 56. You can see there's a very slight curvature to it. Now, the point at which we cross zero, where NPV is zero. Remember, NPV equals zero says we've not made a profit, but we've not made a loss either. So when NPV equals zero, can I lower the board and just use the slide now instead? Yeah. Okay, so where I cross zero happens to be for this particular set of values in case study, 23.6%. And we give that point a name. We call it the DCFRR. Okay. The DCFRR, discounted cash flow rate of return, it's in one of your slides there, so you don't need to write it down, is simply the point at which we cross zero. Now, here's how we should interpret DCFRR. DCFRR that exceeds your company's MARR is an, ac is an acceptable investment. Okay. So if you're crossing the curve on this side of MARR, on the right-hand side, that investment is desirable. Because okay. look what, what it says here. At 15%, your company says, I'm going to choose to invest in your project or not. At 15%, I'm going to choose to invest my money in that project. That's the minimal acceptable return. And this is where it gets confusing. This room, this distance from MARR to DCFRR is a buffer. It's a buffer for uncertainty. And here's why. Your company has gone and lent money from banks and from institutions and from stock markets. And they've calculated that they need to return 15% as the cost of that money. Let's say next year a recession hits and that cost of that money increases. Okay. So now the company, instead of it costing them 15% to lend and borrow money, that interest rate is now 25%. In that new environment, that company is now making a loss on this investment. So interest rates or time value of money have to rise by this distance between MARR and DCFRR before the investment is considered unprofitable. So it's a buffer, a safety zone. Yes, Mark? If you're operating to the left, let's say you're at 15% interest rates today, and next year things improve in the economy and money is available more cheaply, your cost of borrowing goes down, and you can now borrow at 10%. That investment's become more profitable for you. The same investment, you've not gone and changed anything, is now more profitable for you. And we would happily have that. Okay, so that's why we don't really concern ourselves with this direction. I'll come back to that, though, in a minute. We only concern ourselves with this distance here, between MARR and DCFRR. Yeah, but you can be sure that banks, there's always, even on a mortgage, when you rent, uh, when you buy a house, there's always a clause that says at any time the bank can withdraw the mortgage. There's no penalty to them. They can decide tomorrow to tell you, pay me all my money back right now. Okay, so yes, it can be in the bank's favor, but they always have a safety net. <laughs> you don't. Okay, so. So this is our buffer, and we will invest in any investment where DCFRR exceeds MARR. So that's my rule. DCFRR 
must be greater than my minimum acceptable rate of return. Then I'm comfortable investing. Take a look at this example. Unfortunately, I've lost my laser pointer, so I can't visually draw it for you, but let's trace out an investment that starts up there at the top point on the left and comes down and crosses over here. DCFRR is below MARR, okay? That's not an acceptable investment. <coughs> So that's what we look for. The, that discounted cash flow rate of return needs to exceed our minimum acceptable rate of return. Yeah. Um, the, you, you can't really. I mean, to be honest, it's a, it's a concept that you simply say it's the point when your interest rates are such that your NPV is zero. It's, in, it's the point in time where your interest rates are such that you're neither making a profit nor a loss. NPV equals zero. Remember this point on the horizontal axis is simply saying you've not made a loss, but you've not made a profit either. So it's the interest rates that have to be prevalent or time value of money that has to be prevalent for that situation to occur. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, that would, actually that's a great way to say it. If, you pay, if you've taken a loan out at 23.6%, you're essentially giving the bank back all your profit. <laughs> That's a really nice way to put it. Okay. Any profit you make goes straight back into the bank's pocket, not into yours. If you take a loan at MARR rates at 15%, this is the profit that you make. Okay. People always ask me, well, why can't I, why can't I be here? Well, you can be there if your company's MARR is there, but you don't get to say what the MARR is. If your company can go find money from investors and from stock markets at cheaper rates, then their MARR goes down. But if your company is not able to do so, your, your MARR is where it is. Yeah, okay, so I'm thinking of large conglomerates, right? So yeah, they may find one bank that's willing to give them a lower interest rate, but that's just one source of their money coming in. They're still accountable to their other, other investors and other stock market holders. So yeah, it might bump them from 15 to 14.8, but because remember, this is a blended rate over a variety of sources of income. That, yeah, NPV equals zero implies you've broken even. Uh, no, it's, no it's, it's NPV is where you've broken even. And remember this summation in NPV, you decide where it stops, right? So we will stop the NPV additions at a point where we believe the value, the life of the plant is over. So a chemical plant might be 30, 40 years for a unit in a plant. Okay, so you'll, you'll calculate this NPV sum over a long period of time in many engineering situations. If you're calculating the NPV for a motor vehicle, it might be eight years, 10 years. Okay. NPV for a cell phone is three years, two years, five years at the most. Okay, so you fix the time, you decide when to stop adding terms to the summation. Remember, the longer you keep a piece of item, you're not just generating infinite money from this distillation column. There's costs to maintain it. The laborers, electricity costs in the future. So these costs do go up in the future years. They don't just, they don't just go down. Okay, so NPV has two important parts. It has the rate at which it's calculated. I, NPV has a second important part, the number of terms in that summation. Okay, I is easy to get. You go speak to someone in your finance department. 
the life of the, the item, that's also relatively easy to get. We've got 50, 60 years of building chemical plants, a large body of accumulated data. Companies like Hatch and the big contractors, they know what these values are of time durations. Okay, so there's quite a bit of discussion on that. Now let me maybe change, it, change things up a bit and talk a bit about independent investments. So this is over here on the slide 61. And I'm really only interested in the part that you can see right now on the board. So a company sitting on a million dollars, they have two options. They can either invest in that project that you're trying to convince your boss to, to invest in, or your boss can say, no, I'm going to give it a miss and just hold on to that money. If your boss holds on to that money and doesn't spend it, she or he still has to pay back the investors 15%. Okay. So that cost is there. Or they can invest in your project and earn that and more back. So there's always an alternative. Even if there's only one project under consideration, there's always at least two options. When we talk about independent alternatives, let's take a look at an everyday example. You've got $1,000 and you need to buy stuff for your house. The decision to buy one vacuum cleaner versus another vacuum cleaner, that's a mutually exclusive alternative. You're not going to buy two vacuum cleaners. You're going to buy one vacuum or the other. That's mutually exclusive. Independent means you can spend some of that money on a vacuum cleaner and a dishwasher, or you can choose to buy just a vacuum, no dishwasher, or just a dishwasher, no vacuum, or both. Okay. So independent means that you're not, the decision to go one way doesn't affect the decision on the other option or options. So those are independent alternatives and the terminology for that. So let's uh, take a look at this case. Let me put up an example here and you can debate with people around you which projects you would invest in if you were the CEO. So these are, these are millions of dollars or thousands of dollars, it doesn't matter what. Do you invest in project A, B, or C, or some combination of them? If that's the NPV, if the DCFRR, is 23, 17, or 14, and then the cost of the project you need to invest in that project. The initial cost to do so is five million, five million, or seven million. Okay, you have ten million available. So that's available to you. And if you're interested, the company's MARR, let's put it at 8%. How are you going to spend the money? Okay, so that's, yeah, that's what I want you to debate. Which projects are you going to spend the money on? Ta ta discuss it with someone next to you, and then we can talk about it.
The NPV never reached as high as like, like your initial cost was ninety eight thousand. Ninety one thousand, yeah. Or yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And then your NPV got to twenty thousand. But still, like you're putting a lot of money in and you're getting a little bit of money. No, yeah. So remember last year what was the payback time? In that same set with those same set of numbers. Okay, it was two point seven years. Okay. So remember what payback time is. You've dropped in ninety one thousand and then you make it back up again in two point seven years. Then we went on to more years, three, four, five, and we made twenty thousand dollars. So you made twenty thousand profits. Remember, NPV equals zero says you've not made a loss and you've not made a profit. So NPV equals zero means you've sunk in ninety one and you've made ninety one back over future time with time value money. So you've gone beyond that. So you have you have recovered your cost. Okay, so which projects or project do you invest in? Okay, too many options here. So, who says to just invest in C? Okay, do you want to give an explanation why, Mark? More money. More money. Uh, what are you looking at to give you more money? The NPV is higher. Okay, so Mark's going to spend his $10 million on Project C only and keep $3 million aside. Okay, what other, are you making any other decisions to come to that? And your um, NARR is still less than your DCFRR. Okay, DCFRR is 14%. It exceeds 8%, so you meet that criteria, and you've made $40 million. Okay, so that's Project C. Any other options? Yeah. I would invest in <coughs> A and B together. Yeah, because if you invest in C, you have a three million per minute that's dictating your cash. Okay. And also, if you if you combine the NPV uh, of both, yeah. Fifty, that's very very important. Okay, so. This is costing you five million and five million, so you can afford this project A and B. You're going to get twenty million from this project, thirty million from this project, and the DCFRRs for project A and B both exceed the MARR, so you meet that criteria. Brandon, invest twice in project, invest twice in project B. Yeah? Can that happen? <laughs> Duplicate the project. Okay, so that is valid in some instances to invest in project B twice. But usually with mutually, uh, sorry, with, yeah, it's not a mutually exclusive, it's an independent option. So yeah, we can. With mutually exclus exclusive, I was going to say, you usually satisfy the need with that project once. So you wouldn't, you can't invest in a second time. But uh, yeah, these are independent projects. So let's take a look at this and maybe give it a concrete name. Project B might be to invest in a new distillation column. Project A might be to pay your competitor next door to make the product for you. So they're going to use their existing equipment to make the product for you. They're going to sell it to you. You're going to take, put your name on it, on the label, and sell it to your customers, right? All the grocery stores do this, right? You, you know that, right? Like you go to... One company makes the fruit juice and they just put different labels on it for President's Choice, for Loblaws, for A&P, for Metro. So that's, this happens all the time. Contract manufacturing. So that might be contract manufacturing option. Option B might be to buy a distillation column. And option C might be a different technology. But yeah, you could buy two distillation columns. Provided that the market for your product is there. 
right? It's no good making this extra product with your second distillation column and you've got no customers to buy it from you. But yeah, you can invest in projects multiple times. C is the safest option because your buffer zone is the biggest <laughs> buffer between. Oh, sorry, no, I'm looking at the. Okay. The first one is the safest. So first one's the safer option because you get a larger buffer between MAR and DCFR. That would be a secondary criteria that I would consider. A minimum criteria is that your DCFRR exceeds MARR. If then you were looking at two options that had roughly similar economics in terms of NPVs, then yeah, you could absolutely consider giving preference to the one with the greater buffer. What is the cost? The cost of the column, uh, the cost column refers to how much it's going to cost you to get that project started. So you need this budget today to pay for that equipment to get started with that. Yeah. Is there a formula to weight risk? Formula to, is there a formula to weight risk? No, there isn't. Every company will have their own preference, right? So what you will do in a corporation is um, you will de develop a table like this and it will be decided on with a group of people. And the company may have their own internal criteria for how they'll rank investments beyond this one criteria. So this is an important point. There isn't one single number that companies look at. It's not just NPV. It's not just DCFRR exceeding MARR. It's not just payback time. Right? So companies look at multiple criteria and wait, can weight them in different, in different manner. Any further questions on this example? Okay, let me put another one up here, just for some practice. The best one was uh, B twice, because B twice is going to earn you 60 million. A and B together, if, re if you really couldn't do B twice, let's say there's some constraint that prevented you, then you take A and B. The worst option on its own is C. On its own. Okay, if your budget was $12 million, how does that change things? You look at this table, your boss says, you know what? I can go ask for another $2 million from somewhere else. You got $12 million to spend. Then you do B and C. Right? This is why looking at a table of your options in, in this way is helpful. Does everyone see that? If you had $12 million, you can now do B and C together. OK, so let's, um, let's take this table now and step it up with a fourth project D and I'm going to change the numbers here <coughs> okay so there's NPVs for four projects the DCFRR is four percent 14, 7, and 30%. And I'm going to assume all four projects cost the same amount of money. So the cost of the projects really doesn't matter. Let's, we can put them each at 100,000. So cost per project is 100,000. And then this last column then, instead of cost, let's put this as payback time. So the first project pays back in four years, the next one pays back in five years, then two years, and then four years. You have available only 100,000, so only one project.
Okay, so maybe the easiest way to do it is by elimination. Which projects don't you invest in? A and C. Okay, that's clear. So those are out of contention. So then which projects do you invest in? You have to pick one. B or D? Who votes B? Who votes D? Okay. Which one's right? <laughs> Chris thinks they're both right. Okay, so they can be right. Yeah, sorry. I have just a quick question, but maybe you just address it. But uh, would it depend on the inflation and money based on like X meter or like just the graph? Okay. The NPV takes that into account because the NPV has got the life of the project built in. The summation is there, yeah. Rune? Uh, are we assuming that after the five years or four years we're done with that or do we continue on for... That's the, uh, fi the payback time is the payback time as it's defined, but NPV... Do we continue the process of giving the money? NPV takes that into account. Remember, NPV has the, the life of the project into account. Okay, so both options could work in, in a company depending on their risk profile. Right, so a company that really is risk averse might go for project D. They're willing to earn less money but accept this bigger buffer. Okay, there's a, there's a greater certainty they're going to get their money because the DCFRR is so high. A company that's maybe a little bit more nimble and willing to take risks to get more money at the expense that this 14% is pretty close to eight. And so if the cost of borrowing goes up, that 13,000 may actually disappear. They may not get that full 13,000. So come, this is where this idea of risk comes in and waiting and why looking at it in a tabular form is so helpful. Okay, yes. The only thing that NPV does not take into account, this is a good point, is the fluctuation in interest rates. Okay, we're going to talk about that in about a week or so, maybe a bit more. Okay, so next class we're going to look at two important concepts, taxes and depreciation. So I'll post the new notes for that on the website.